Good afternoon or good evening, I think we might as well say, and welcome to the final CPD session of our CPD Day uh, in association with work alongside Sibsy West Midlands. Just a few um, housekeeping rules before we make a start. Um, so please, uh, sorry, go for the start, been a long day. So welcome, thank you for joining our Tech CPD, delivered in a partnership with Sibsy West Midlands. Sibsy West Midlands region aims to expand the knowledge of its members through various learning initiatives, and we hope that you find today's topics insightful. Just a little bit of courtesy to myself and the other guests and other participants, we play out to all delegates uh, to put themselves onto mute uh, when not talking, and know that anything that may be written into the chat can be seen by all, because we are working in an open protocol. And um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the CPD, um, so please write any questions that you might have into the chat box or use that raise hand function and I will try and get to you as quick as I can. I do have a colleague with me who will be monitoring the chat and um, so if anything pops up, I will do my best to answer it as we go along. Um, for the CPD, you will also be issued with a CPD certificate of attendance, uh, which was sent to you via email. So we'll go back a slide. So today uh, in this CPD, what we are going to look at is the understanding of, of radiator valves, whether it be dynamic or presetables, thermostatic radiator valves. So we're just going to take a look. It's not the longest CPD, so hopefully we, it's sort of a bit short, a bit sharp, a bit sweet, um, but we'll take everything that we, that we need from this presentation. So course objectives, what we hope you will take away from today. First of all is why do we need to balance? How do we achieve that thermal comfort? I think as soon as we understand that, you know, balancing becomes a little bit easier. We look at some of the basic theories that sit around balancing. We're talking now about radiant circuits, so uh, the heating systems within dwellings. We'll look at some of the traditional methods of how we do it by using TRVs or thermostatic radiator valves, but then we'll move into some of the more advanced methods of presetable and also dynamic control as well and how those work. So, um, so yeah, like I say, it's not been the longest one, um, but please feel free to ask any questions as we go through. Um, and yeah, we'll make a start. So first of all, why do we balance heating circuits? Um, it's comfort essentially, that's what we're trying to achieve, that's the end goal, and comfort is achieved by equilibrium within our environment in the absence of any form of discomfort. But there are many variables that determine what these are, and we break it down into two factors. So we look at invisible comfort, but we also look at thermal comfort dependency. So when we look at invisible comfort, we look at things like thermal and hydrometric, uh, hydrometric comfort, uh, the, the olfactory comforts in relation to the air quality, the visual comfort, which is related to things like lighting, and the physiological comfort, which is how we feel in our environment. So, you know, there are all these sorts of factors, believe it or not, which impact on, on, on the, in the environment and the comfort that we perceive we have. If we look at something like thermal dependencies, so we're looking at things like physical parameters, air temperature, mean radiant temperature, relative humidity, air speed, atmospheric pressure, all this kind of stuff. Um, has an impact on the thermal comfort or the dependence of the building. External parameters, such as things like activity, affecting metabolism or the clothing that you're wearing. Obviously, it goes without saying, in, you know, if you're sitting in a room in the summer and the ambient temperature is quite hot and you're wearing a hooded jumper uh, or a coat, you're very well going to be uncomfortable because you're going to be too hot. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the, that's something that we can take care of. And some of the factors are things like organic factors and those are to the age of the person, the sex of the person, an individual physical characteristic like people's build. You know, everybody has a different perception in, in how they feel, um, especially sort of in, in work environments and in office environments. There's always a battle with the air conditioning control. You know, some people feel hot, some people feel cold. It is all down to personal preference when it comes to how, how we feel, feel comfortable in certain environments, shall we say. So causes of thermal losses. Now, these are some things that, are, that, that we really need to focus on. You know, we, we, we see excessive temperature in uh, differential in vertical heat pockets. So, you know, one side of the room may feel cold, one side of the room may feel warm. You know, it, it's really important that we, that we take care of those. Things like fast air streams, you know, is air is moving around quite, uh, quickly. Is it going to take the heat away? Is it going to create a thermal loss? You know, if you open the door to a room, there's a draft coming through, all that heat is going to be pulled away from the room. So those fast air streams also have an impact. Asymmetrical radiation, so controlling the radiation correctly or incorrectly, are we putting radiators in the correct place of uh, design or part of a room to ensure we're getting full efficiency from where they may be? But also things like incorrectly controlled surface temperatures. When we refer to surface temperatures, we talk about things like underfloor heating. We're looking at things like radiators. Um, you know, anywhere where we're emitting heat, we have to control that surface temperature. If we do it incorrectly, you know, we're going to start to suffer things uh, what we would class as things like thermal loss. So just a little bit on, on thermal losses and the causes of thermal losses. You know, obviously, you know, we take a look at the, the obvious things like leaving doors and windows open and, you know, incorrect um, insulation in properties. 
all this has an impact uh, on, on thermal comfort and, and, and thermal losses within the house. So you know, all things to take into, into consideration when we're trying to determine what is a, what is a comfortable environment for us to, uh, to sit in. So human factor versus system factor. Now, what do we mean by this and, and, and how does it help in balanced systems? As I said previously, now, the human factor, individual comfort levels are, are a key part when it comes to heating systems. As I say, some people feel the heat completely different to others. Um, and that can cause you know, imbalances. Things like load increases or load decreases because certain people feel a, a certain temperature, they may put more, more load on the system or systems. People might start to turn systems down, which in, in turn adds a different kind of load, or load increase or decrease on the system. So us as human beings have a huge amount of impact on the way that systems operate because of our very own thermal comfort and thermal dependencies. System factors, um, you know, this is where we start to look at what the actual system does to control it and, and, and how that causes problems. Things like inlet regulation, so we look at the way we control the heat or the water that goes through systems. Energy wastage, you know, are we, are we putting the right heat to the right places? Now, one of the, the simple ways that we look at it is, you know, we, we need to achieve a temperature equilibrium where we're in the environment that we're, that we're in. So, you know, do we, um, you know, do we work with the misconception that, you know, we've got a, a house and I don't use certain rooms, so I turn the heating up. Is that going to increase efficiency? No, it's not. Absolutely, it's going to have the absolute opposite effect. So, what we need to try and do is, is achieve a medium temperature or mean temperature across every single service, every single room in a property to achieve a good efficiency, but b that, that thermal comfort which we're trying to achieve. Now, if we take a look at imbalances of, uh, within systems, um, this, you know, obviously this shows what, what we class as the larger system, but you can sort of scale this down to, to be something like a domestic property. So where we look here, we can see the red, we can see the grey zone and the blue zone. So the, the red zone itself is, is where there's the two higher flow rates. Now, water by its very nature, um, is lazy, it will go down its path of least resistance to, 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 to create a path essentially. So if we've got a system as, as, as shown here, where we've got sort of five, um, five rows of, of, of radiators uh, in, in, in a heights of five, so 25 panels, what we have here is the water that's coming from the heat emitter for the heat generator is only going to circulate around that bottom corner because it's lazy, the water will reach where it wants to get to, go around the system and go itself back. The system, the part of the system in the, in the central zone will probably be okay. You'll probably get you know, uh, you know, uh, a reasonable amount of heat, but not exactly what you want. But also look at that top right-hand corner, we've got cut as an, an unfavoured zone. So there you're not really going to get any of the hot water you need and it's going to remain cold. And you're never really going to get where we need to get to. And there's, there's always like a simplified way that, that I was always taught of, of how to balance heating systems or the theory behind it. And it's all about getting the right amount of water at the right temperature to the right place at the right time. And if we can understand what that is. We, we have almost the, you know, the, the, the sort of understanding of thermal balances in a nutshell, really. So there's ways that we can sort of now start to counteract this as a system. We need to balance it. Generally, you will see issues in a domestic property in your home. So if your boiler is situated in your kitchen, um, you know, your kitchen, your living room and, and one of the other downstairs room will probably get really good heat. But you may find in a bedroom that's further away from the from the heat emitter from the boiler may not necessarily get as hot, but the, but the radiators downstairs are really, really warm. Um, so it's a case of creating balance. We need to slow the water down going into the to the closer zones and push it to those more distant zones. And that's how we're going to start to achieve the thermal comfort that we look for. So without system balancing, each zone will not function as desired. Sorry, as designed. And there will be areas that will never cool and areas that will never heat up. And this is what we're known as thermal imbalances. So again, we can see in, the, in a slightly separate or slightly different diagram here, the red panel radiators there are just getting really, really hot. And they will probably never cool down because we cannot restrict the flow through there. The pump is pumping hot water through those panel radiators and they're probably running at 120% efficiency or 100% load. So they're always going to be really hot. The orange band going through the middle, going to be okay. You know, you're going to get relative temperature from there. Um, but maybe still a little bit warm. As we go a little bit further away, you can see the two two green radiators towards the top right hand corner. Those are going to be the ones that are probably going to be the best balanced you know, in the system. But having you know having two out of that many uh, balanced is not right. It's not what we're looking for. And that very top right hand corner absolutely shows um, you know an imbalance of the system. So essentially, what we need to do is slow the amount of water going through those red radiators and those orange radiators and push it towards the green and the blue. So we you know we restrict the flow down the bottom. To increase it in, in, in um, so it's a, to want to make it reach those more distant zones. So, when we look at this 
you know, as a system, there are also external factors uh, which 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 do play a part in the way that systems load and, and heat loads and demands will, will alter as external factors take over. For example, a south facing building with large windows will require a different heat demand to a north facing building with small uh, with small windows. But also temperature increases throughout the day. Uh, you know, as the, as the sun starts to rise in the morning, uh, you know, that the building could have cooled down overnight. But as the sun starts to rise, it's going to start to increase. If you live in things like multiple occupancy or a house that's got multiple rooms on the front and the back, as that heat starts to increase, as the sun starts to rise, you're going to need less heat load closer to those radiators, and it's then going to push it. You know, we need to push it further inside where we're going to need that heat demand, and that goes in a cycle through 24 hours. So, in the morning, the sun will start to rise, start to heat up. Middle of the day, towards the afternoon, at the maximum ambient temperature, it's going to be start. Even in the winter, you know, the glass is going to magnify the heat, and as the sun starts to set a different part, the heat load again is going to change. So, whenever you're looking at building design. Or where buildings are, it's really important that you you take into uh, you know into into consideration how the external um, external factors are going to impact on the building itself. So just remember that sunrise, sunset, and, and the make of the building, it's glass, is it brick or whatever else it may be. So some of the, some of the more traditional methods, as we may know, I'm going to probably put a stamp out there that probably 97, 98, if not 99 percent of all homes will use a traditional method of balancing. And that's where we use a thermostatic radiator valve or a TRV. They all look pretty similar, generally come in a white or a chrome uh, chrome head. You can adjust them from one to five or, or one to V, depending on how you've got the, the, the dials in there. But essentially, each one of those settings equates to an ambient set temperature. So the, the radiator valve will sense the room temperature, sense where it needs to be, and it will start to open or close, depending on what those temperatures are, to control the flow through the radiator. So adding the TRV is absolutely fine. The balance becomes easier to achieve because we're, we're achieving an equilibrium of temperature in each room. But then the or the hydronic flow paths valves can become quite noisy. So on large systems, if the room starts to heat up, um, and we start to use thermostatic valves to, to, to try and regulate the flow as they close down because we've still got high volume of water trying to push themselves through. They can become noisy if they're not balanced correctly. So, you know, when we look down those lines, TRV is always going to be your, your first step of, uh, of, of your first stop of balancing. You tend to do them in partnership with what we call a lock shield valve. You tend to do your flow regulation off the lock shield valve. So you read the temperatures between the flow and the return. You'll regulate your float, uh, your your lock shield um, down to, to close it to get the right amount of flow, and your TRV will control the temperature. Now, the um, the the key to a radiator is to slow the water down as much as you can. The slower the water moving through the radiator, the more chance you've got of dissipating heat. If your lock shield valve is fully open and your TRV is fully open, the hot water is just going to go straight through. You're not going to get the efficiency out of the system that you need. You're not going to get that heat transfer. So we slow the water down, and then we withdraw it as best we can get those temperatures out. So that's TRVs. As we start to move forward a little bit now, we start to look at more advanced methods. And this is where we start to use what's called a presettable radiator valve. So it still works in conjunction with the TRV or a thermostatic radiator valve. But what the, the, the TRV, uh, what the presettable one does, um, it works in combination with thermostatic control heads and makes it possible to keep the ambient temperature automatically constant at a set value in the room where they're installed, thus guaranteeing effective energy saving. So We've, we've never really had any control. There's always been a basic theory of, of, of a lock shield valve, as we said before, you know, we turn lock shield down to a certain flow rate. What we can start to do now with pre-settable radiator valves is set the flow rate through every single radiator. So we can use a, um, an equation to work out what the flow rate may be to give us a certain heat load. We can then set every single radiator to that flow rate. We remove the need for a lock shield valve and we can guarantee that that flow rate is always going to be sound through that radiator. It's really, really good. It's a really good way of doing it it allows you to balance the system better. So we can see here that what you'd probably find if, if we work off, for example, a setting of uh, of one to one to five, you would probably, you know, one being closed and five being open. What we can do now is control the flow rates through each individual radiator. And you may very well find that some on, on, on right, if you work from bottom, bottom right up to the top left, Radiators one, two, three, four, and five may only be on setting one. So we're trying to reduce the flow as much as we can. As we go up through the building, we send off to put them on settings two and three. So they're becoming more and more open. As we get to the top of the building, we're probably going to be on a five, so fully open. So what we've done is we've taken the water and we've pushed it all the way up, pushed it up to the building to the most distant zones, but we're still getting heat at the bottom. So we're balancing that system by using the presettable devices. The, the drawback with presettable devices is still a manual way of doing it. 
So should somebody completely isolate a radiator or do something with the system, it's going to impact everywhere else on the system because we've still got the same volume of water moving at the same rate. So if we take anything, you know, we change that parameter within the system, it's going to have an impact. So we just have to remember that it's still a very manual way of, um, of doing it. So moving forward, best practice, we start to look at uh, what we call uh, dynamic, which is like what we call pressure independence. Uh, uh, control. It's, just, it's again, it's, it's a different way of doing it. It's a more modern way. It's a very modern way of doing it. And if you follow some of the best practice guides, you know, this is what they recommend uh, is, is what we use for it. Now, the difference being on something like a dynamic controlled radiator valve is that what we're doing is we're making every single radiator in the system a completely separate zone. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So the use of dynamic control allows the automatic dynamic balancing and pressure independent adjustment of the thermal medium in radiators and two pipe systems. And again, this device in conjunction with the thermostatic electronic or thermoelectric controller combines different functions in, in one single component. So we spoke previously about where we use manual balancing. We can set the flow through every single radiator, but if one of those single parameters changes, everything else changes on the system. What fitting a dynamically controlled radiator valve allows you to do is every single radiator will become independent from itself. It becomes its own independent zone. So if you had a system of 10 radiators and you set all your flow rates using using a, a, a dynamically controlled radiator valve and your and your the pressure that goes through it, you could then remove two radiators from that system completely. What that would do is it wouldn't impact on those other eight radiators because this valve would manually or automatically adjust itself to ensure that it was working alongside the system. Uh, the technology comes from things like um, fan core control, where, where flow rate is very important, but we obviously it, it need everything to be independent from itself on the system. So it's a very clever way of doing it. And it, like I say, it helps you to manually, so uh, automatically balance systems as they go through their sort of heating and cooling cycle. And just to sort of show you a little bit of, of an example, without the likes of, uh, of a dynamic house, so on the left-hand side, we've got a manually balanced system. So we can see we've set a system now to 100 percent you know efficiency on every single radiator but now if we turn three of those radiators off we can see now we've got 110 percent 130 and 140 percent going through the other radiator because we've imbalanced that system because we removed three of the radiators if we now look at the right hand side we've using using a dynamically controlled radiator valve we put 100 percent load through each single uh, panel radiator at one time if we then take three of those radiators offline we still get exactly the same amount of water or medium going through those the, the, the remaining three radiators so everything's independent everything will automatically adjust should there be any changes through the system so again it's a more modern way of doing it we're seeing it more and more now where efficiency is really important and um, things like low temperature networks and um, some of the district heating projects that we work on use these sort of things because you can guarantee the flow rate and you can set your parameters which means you you know the design side of your system becomes even easier to achieve um so i hope that all made sense that is the end of the presentation i did say it was short and sweet um luckily with the last one of the day uh, it means it better. i'm not sure if there has been any questions that have come through i don't think there are um if anybody has got a question please feel free to ask but if not, uh, I really appreciate again everyone's time uh, in, in in sitting through these um, these presentations. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to, to head over to our website, which is www.rtechnic.co.uk. Um, we've got plenty of information over there. Also on our uh, YouTube page, head of YouTube and search for our tech. We've got lots of videos uh, on there as well, which hopefully will give a little bit more education. Also our Our Technic uh, Academy where you can register and do a, a series of online CPDs again to get some um, get some certification for yourself, some CPD time as well. So uh, I can just see that one more person is, is typing, so I'm just going to hang on in case it's a question. Uh, I say I'm speaking of TRVs, which I needed. Any chance of this, size, we can sort of, we, we'll sort that out. Yeah, please don't worry. If you if you just drop, um, drop me, if I put, I'll put my email address into the chat, uh, if you just drop me an email, I'll say the slide deck. Uh, that's not a problem. Oh, can't spell the email address. Still not spelled, you know. It's been a long day. I'll tell you, yeah, right. That's my email address. Feel free to to drop me an email over, um, and I'll show you the, the, the start of the slides as well. So, um, thanks very much, everybody. It's been a long day. Anybody who's been on all of them, congratulations. Uh, well done. We do appreciate everyone's time. We know that is it is precious, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And we hope to see you at our next event. Take care and see you all soon.